Michelle Shelley Watson was born on April 15, 1954 in Battleground, Washington, which is close to Vancouver in one direction and the Oregon border in the other. Her parents Les and Sharon had Shelley and two other children, Paul and Chuck. Les and Sharon did not stay together though. While Les was a stable man and a hard worker, the same could not be said about Sharon. She was known to abuse alcohol and other substances and was neglectful of her three children. She decided to dump the kids on Les, who had remarried. We will call his wife Laura in this story, although her real name has not been revealed for privacy reasons. Laura and Les did their best to raise the three kids, which Laura says were very unruly. She says the most defiant one was always Shelly, and as much as Laura tried to be a good mother to her young stepdaughter, Shelly would always push back. Laura claims that Shelly would profess her hate for her literally every single day. Laura and Les would take the kids to Mount Hood to go skiing in the winter sometimes, or boating trips to the coast in the summer, and Shelly would pitch a fit and say she wasn't going. Or when she did go, she would throw tantrums for no reason in order to ruin everybody else's good time. She would steal money from family members, and even tried to burn her parents' house down one time. She'd also break up pieces of glass and put the pieces in her siblings' shoes. Tragedy would strike when Shelly was only 13, when she found out that her biological mom Sharon had been murdered. By this time, Sharon had been living on the streets of California. A man she had been seeing was surviving on Skid Row with her, both of them hooked on drugs. And one night, the man beat the life out of her. When Laura broke the news to Shelly, it did not seem to face her in the slightest. There was no reaction at all, as if she didn't care. Shelly didn't seem to have love for anybody except for one person, and that would be her grandmother Anna on her father's side. Shelley would inherit many traits from Anna, but they would be the kind of traits a monster would have, not a well-adjusted, considerate person. Anna Watson was a large, intimidating woman with a husband named George. No one would dare disagree with the woman, including her own husband, who she forced to sleep in a tiny shed outside their house. Her husband did anything she wanted him to do. Anna Watson ran a nursing home that was owned by the Watsons. She referred to her employees as quote unquote her retards and she would berate them and put them down any chance she got and she would actually assault them by pulling their hair sometimes. Shelley would see how fearful people were of Anna. They wouldn't tell her no to anything. If they dared to even think of defying the large woman, they may as well run and dig a hole and hide somewhere. Shelley would spend a great deal of time with Anna and she also started to learn how to manipulate people, and her lies would get bigger and more dangerous. When Shelly was 15, she had falsely accused her father of raping her. Les and Laura were devastated by the allegation, which they knew to be a blatant lie. The accusation was proven to be false, and not possible after a thorough examination. Les was so hurt that his daughter would say this about him. It could have potentially ruined his reputation and landed him in prison. But Shelly acted like nothing happened, like she didn't make the appalling statement, and she certainly wouldn't apologize to her father. That would mean that she had done something wrong. And one thing you will learn in this story is that Shelly Watson is never wrong. Les and Laura had such a hard time with Shelly that they ended up sending her to live with Les's sister and her husband at one point, who lived on the opposite side of the country in Pennsylvania. Needless to say, all did not go well and Shelley was returned to Les and Laura shortly after. And it has been said that Shelley was the reason her aunt and uncle ended up divorcing. While Shelley was living in PA, she would meet a guy named Randy Rivardo, who she developed strong feelings for. Shelley was 17 at that time. When Shelley went back to live in Washington with her parents, she told them all about this guy that she met. This gave Les a great idea. With Shelley almost 18, Les would invite Randy out to Washington where he'd have a job lined up waiting for him and a place to stay, rent free. Then him and Shelly could be together. Shelly would be 18 soon. She could get married and Les figured she'd be somebody else's problem. It wasn't that he didn't love his daughter. He was just at his wit's end with her. Between the lying, the horrible attitude, and the destruction that Shelly caused, she was also costing him a lot financially speaking. Les would break down and give in to Shelly's demands a lot of times, whether it be a new car or what have you. But if he didn't give in to his spoiled daughter, she would find a way to steal his whole paycheck. Fortunately, Les's fortitude was right on the money, 
and Shelley and Randy got married and had a daughter named Nikki in February of 1975. But it wasn't the marriage everyone had hoped for. Shelley could not be pleased. She was so unsatisfied with the trailer they were renting that she faked getting attacked and sexually assaulted there in hopes of proving to her husband they should find another place to live. She was also spending a lot of money on credit that they didn't have to pay back in the future. Randy was going to college at the time, and times were very tight. When Randy filed for divorce, he felt kind of relieved. He hadn't really known how unbearable Shelly was until he was in too deep, and the way that Shelly had verbally abused him had taken its toll. But to get even with Randy for leaving her, Shelly made several large purchases in Randy's name, just to put him deeper into debt. By the age of 24, Shelly was on to her second marriage. This time it was a man named Danny Long, who had been her neighbor. They would have a daughter in August of 1978, who they would name Samantha, or Sammy. The relationship was a lot more volatile than Shelly's first marriage, if that was even possible. There were consistent shouting matches between the two, and things would sometimes get physical. One time when Laura was going to their house to see her granddaughters, she noticed some holes in the wall inside. It could have come from Danny or Shelly, especially considering Shelly's explosive temper. After five long years, the marriage would come to a halt, and Shelly would move on. In 1983, 29-year-old Shelly would meet polite, outdoorsy, hard-working Dave Nautek. It seemed that the third time might be the charm. When I say that, I'm speaking in terms of longevity, not that the relationship was in any way healthy, because it certainly was not. The whole thing was confusing to 8-year-old Nikki. She thought of Danny as her dad, even though Randy was her real dad, and now she had to call this new stranger her dad. She didn't know anything about him, but her mother liked what she knew of the man. Danny was a country boy from Pacific County, who grew up on the Elk Creek trails of Washington. His parents were hard workers, but never really had much money and would have to scrape to get by. Sometimes his parents couldn't even afford to get new clothes for Dave and his siblings when they started a new school year. Dave went to Raymond High School, which he graduated from in 1971. He didn't think that he wanted to follow in his father's footsteps in the logging industry, so he decided to join the Navy. He spent a lot of time surfing and meeting young women after he was discharged. He was known as something of a ladies' man, but when he first saw Shelly at a bar down in Long Beach, he was too intimidated to even approach her. He said she looked like a movie star with her long red hair and her blue eyes. But Shelly would end up approaching him and they would hit it off right away. The fact that Dave was a hard worker and didn't have a lot of means didn't really mean much to Shelly. She would mold him into what she wanted him to be. He would do what she wanted him to do. The first house of horrors that Shelly and Dave purchased was in Old Willapah. They called it the Louderback House after the original owners. The house was large with a bedroom for each of the girls, and it had a musty basement downstairs. The girls really loved that house. Shelly was keen on the location of the property. It worked to her advantage that the house was tucked back into the forest a little bit, away from the road, which sat on a curve. Nobody could really see what was being done on the property. Nikki recalls that her mother really liked to carry out punishments at the new house, and really for no reason at all. Shelly just liked to enforce discipline. Nikki would tend to get it a lot worse than Sammy. Nikki would try to avoid the punishment even if it was unavoidable. Sammy was the baby of the two. She would tell her mother how much she loved her, and this would work in Sammy's favor a lot of times. Nikki's earliest memories of the abuse would come at night when the girls were sleeping. Shelly would wake them up by dragging them out of their beds. It didn't matter if it was freezing cold in the winter. The girls would be dragged outside and made to run around the house. This could go on for hours. Sometimes Shelly would make Nikki wallow as she called it, in which Nikki had to strip off her clothes and go outside in the nude. It didn't matter how cold it was. Shelly would make Nikki lay down in mud while she chastised her and called her young daughter a stupid fucking pig. Then Shelly would spray her with a hose, or she would have Dave spray her with a hose. Shelly would also take away the girls' showering privileges, claiming that the well had run dry. The girls would have to go to school and maybe hadn't bathed in weeks. The girls were not allowed to use the bathroom without their mother's permission either. And Nikki and Sammy grew not to get attached to too many things, because Shelly would take things away after little or no infraction was committed. 
Nikki was given a Cabbage Patch doll one Christmas that was taken away the next day and put in a closet because Shelly claimed Nikki was ungrateful. Nikki would find her doll to play with when her mother wasn't around, but Shelly would beat both of the girls with an electric cord after discovering this betrayal. When Nikki ran away from a punishment, it would enrage Shelly and Nikki would get clobbered so much harder. One time Shelly was going to use a whip on Nikki, who tried to get away. When Shelly caught up with her, she kept whipping her and whipping her until Nikki was nothing but a bloody mess. She couldn't even walk away. Sammy witnessed this silently with tears streaming down her face. Nikki recalls one time where there was maybe a speck of humanity she saw in her mother. Nikki was being chased by Shelly. The severe beating was something Nikki wanted to avoid at all costs. As Shelly threatened and lunged at Nikki, Nikki fell through a plate glass door. There were pieces of glass protruding from her body all over. Nikki was cut up bad and bleeding everywhere. She should have been taken to the hospital. Of course, she wasn't though. How could Shelly explain this away along with all the other bruises Nikki had sustained? But Shelly did apologize and took Nikki to get her hair done the following day. Nikki wasn't sure if her mother was genuinely sorry and had turned a new leaf. Shane Watson was Shelly's nephew by her brother Paul. Paul had been living a life of crime and done a lot of time throughout his life. Shane had been very unhappy with his less than kosher upbringing. But in the summer of 1988, when Shane was 13 years old, his aunt Shelly offered to take him in. Shane was a little rough around the edges, but he was optimistic of this. He thought it might be a fresh start that would benefit him. He was greeted with a lot of love when he first arrived at the Louder House. Nikki and Sammy were excited to hang out with their cool cousin. Shane had no idea the abuse the girls had suffered and had no clue that he would be given the same dose of torture soon enough. Shane wasn't used to adults barking at him to do chores all day. He was hesitant but he soon fell in line and would do Shelly's long list of chores that took all day to do. Although Shane had a kind of tough exterior, he grew to be quite frightened of Shelly. He grew really close with Nikki who was the same age as him. Shane had his shower privileges revoked, had to ask permission to use the bathroom, and he was made to sleep in the cold, musty basement that had dizzying diesel fumes. Shane didn't even have a bed. Laura Watson showed up to see her grandson and noticed he had no bed and said something to Shelly about it. Eventually, she got a bed for the young teenager at Laura's insistence. Shane would often confide in Nikki and tell her how nuts her mom was. He wouldn't dare say it to Shelly though, because the damage his would be too severe. Nikki agreed wholeheartedly with Shane. Shelly would start to do things to the two of them, just to humiliate them. The two cousins were forced to undress and slow dance with each other. Sammy watched on in horror. This went on until Shelly determined that they were embarrassed enough. They also had to wallow like pigs outside in the mud, naked, while getting sprayed by Dave. Shane had finally had enough. He was tired of Shelly the psycho torturing him. He decided he was going to run away. He tried to talk Nikki into running away with him, but she couldn't bring herself to do it. She figured she'd only have to endure this agony until she was 18. Then she would leave and never come back. Shane would follow through and leave. He would eventually run away several times over the years, but each time Shelly would gather the family in the car and they would hunt for him. And Shelly would always find him. Shelly's attitude would suddenly shift, and she'd say, I love you Shane, why would you leave? Please don't do that again. He'd be brought back and given clothes that might have been taken away before. He might be given a bed for a day or two, but within two or three days, privileges would be taken away again, and he would be beaten. And he had a new place to sleep now. It was in Nikki's closet. Shane and Nikki would go back and forth about how much they hated Shelly but it seemed useless to fight against her. It was a losing battle. Little did they know that a new house guest would take some of the attention off them as far as punishments go. Kathy Loreno had been a friend of Shelly Nautex for years. She was a 34 year old hairdresser and stood at six feet tall. Kathy had been struggling. She was unable to keep up with her house payments. She had lost her job and gone into a depressive state. She had thought about moving back in with her mother, but that did not end up happening. Her friend Shelly told her that she could move in with her, that she wouldn't have to work, wouldn't have to pay rent. Shelly wanted some help with the kids, 
and on top of that, Shelley was about to have her third child. Tori would be born in June of 1989. When Kathy moved in, Shane and Nikki found her to be very bossy and kind of overbearing, but Sammy actually liked her. Shelly told Kathy her kids were terrible, especially Shane and Nikki, so Kathy took this at face value. One time, Kathy had given Sammy a necklace for her birthday. Sammy declared that it was her favorite present that she was given. That was a big mistake, because after the party, Shelly took a belt and beat the shit out of Sammy with it screaming at how ungrateful she was. Shelly started demanding that Kathy clean and do chores around the house. Shelly was quick to snap at her for any little thing, and she would then give her pills, usually Prozac, but Shirley was said to have a pharmacy in her house with muscle relaxers, painkillers, antidepressants, and even horse tranquilizers. If Shelly wasn't satisfied with Kathy's cleaning, she'd grab the closest hard object like a book and hit Kathy in the head with it. Then Shelly was quick to give her a hug and some pills. The pills seemed to assure to keep Kathy loopy and submissive to do what the tormentor wanted her to. The psychological and physical abuse would escalate as time went on. Shelly accused Kathy of walking into Shane's bedroom naked in the middle of the night. Kathy denied she ever did this. Shelly would get Shane to corroborate her claim even though Shane knew this didn't happen. Kathy denied it at first but was successfully humiliated by Shelly and forced to apologize to her and Shane. At this point, the kids were abused less now that the attention was mainly on the treatment of Kathy, and Shelly made the girls participate in tormenting Kathy. Shelly made the girls constantly flick rubber bands at her. Shelly would command that Shane punch and kick Kelly and he would comply. He didn't want to do it, but you don't say no to Shelly. Shelly would start to take away personal items of Kathy's that she had brought from home. She would also take away Kathy's clothes and make Kathy clean in the nude all day. When the family went on their family camping trip, Kathy would be forced to ride in the trunk. The kids would talk to her through the trunk as if this was just normal, although they knew how wrong and messed up this all was. Kathy would put up the tents for the family before Shelly told her that her place to sleep was underneath the car. And so Kathy continued to suffer extreme physical abuse back at home, and she was being fed pills nonstop. She was getting very weak, and her hair was falling out, along with most of her teeth. Her skin was all sagging down, and she was a shell of the bubbly person she once was. She was living down in the basement at this point, and she was talking as if she were delirious. Shane and Nikki discussed Kathy's appearance, and Shane commented on how bad she was looking that she has to go or otherwise she would probably die. Nikki agreed with this assessment. Shane told Kathy that she's got to go now, that this was her only chance, that she needs to take it. However, Kathy wouldn't budge and Shane started getting frustrated with her, saying, what the fuck is wrong with you? Get out of here. Kathy was too afraid to leave. She knew that Shelly would find her and she would be beaten over it. She was so terrified and she felt completely hopeless. In 1992, the Notex had to downgrade to a farmhouse on Monaghan Landing Road in Raymond. A lot of work needed to be done on the property and in the house. Good thing Shelly had her helpers. This house was not as well hidden as the one in Willapaw. Shelly really had to watch what the neighbors could see. At this new house, Kathy wanted to escape and she tried to on more than one occasion. She even tried running away naked one time. It wasn't long before Shelly caught her and brought her back. A severe punishment followed from this, in which Shelly forced Dave to brutalize Kathy. Shelly yelled at Dave to kick Kathy in the head with his steel-toed boots, and Dave, he did what he was told. At this time, Dave really was only home on the weekend. Shelly had forced him to get a new job that would pay him more, so she could spend that money. He ended up getting a job hundreds of miles away from home, in Whidbey Island, working 16-hour days. Meanwhile at the house, Kathy's health continued to decline. Even so, Shelly wanted to try out new punishments on Kathy, so she decided to create a waterboarding contraption. The reason for the punishment was quite simple. Shelly took away Kathy's bathroom privileges, and Kathy really had to go and she didn't want to wake up Shelly to ask permission to use the bathroom in the middle of the night. Instead, Kathy defecated in some Tupperware. 
Shelly ended up finding it later, and she lost her shit. By now, Kathy was so weak and had lost so much weight, she could barely walk. Shelly came down and got her before dunking her head underwater. The kids witnessed this torture, and it was clear that Shelly was getting immense satisfaction from this. After, Shelly would try to carry Kathy to the shower. Kathy couldn't balance herself and ended up falling through the glass door. Her legs and stomach were badly cut, and the cuts were very deep. She needed stitches, but of course Shelly refused to take her to the hospital. She was put to bed while still bleeding. Not long after, Sammy would check on Kathy. She was cold and unresponsive. Kathy had died. Sammy took Kathy's death the hardest. She really loved her. Shelly was in full panic mode at this point and Dave had to make the long journey home to figure out what to do. After confirming that Kathy was indeed dead, he ended up burning Kathy's body in a fire pit on the property. It took over five hours to cremate. From there, he drove to Washaway Beach to scatter the ashes. Shelly came up with a story that Kathy had run away with an old boyfriend named Rocky. She would quiz the kids on the details of this lie over the years and scream at them if they took too long to answer her questions. Shelly even made Nikki write fake letters from Kathy to her mother Kay, saying where she was. 19 year old Shane made the decision that he was done with this madness. He told Nikki his parents are psychotic and he was prepared to turn them in. Shelly already didn't trust Shane and Dave wondered if Shane would eventually tell somebody and the cold hard truth would come out. There's no statute of limitations on murder. In November of 1995, Shane was gone. He had run away so many times before, so maybe that was the case this time. Shelly packed everyone in the car and they went looking for him. In the past, it could take hours, maybe days to find Shane, but Shelly would never give up until he was found. But in this case, she gave up the search very quickly and Shane never turned up. Nikki didn't know what to think of Shane's disappearance. Shortly after, Shelly said that she received a letter from Shane saying that he was in Alaska and that he loves her. Nikki didn't believe that Shane had sent the letter. Shane always had hated Shelly so much, so the letter didn't make a lot of sense. The next time that Shelly attacked, Nikki did not run away. It would surprise herself and her mother when she stood her ground and fought back. She even told Shelly to fuck off. Shelly got thrown to the ground and was in complete disbelief. Nikki was 20 at this point and just as big as her mother. And just like any bully in the schoolyard, Shelly retreated and backed down. She ended up kicking Nikki out of the house and sending her to Dave's sister's house. As long as Nikki didn't have to stay in this house of nightmares, she didn't care where she went. This would have very negative consequences on six-year-old Tori, unfortunately. Right after Nikki moved out, Tori was woken up to Shelly punching her in the face repeatedly. After she was done, she told Tori how selfish Nikki was and that she didn't care about her or love her. Tori would be reminded of how much Nikki hated her over the years. By her mother, of course. And Tori would have to endure humiliation, constant screaming in her face, getting woken up in the middle of the night to do demeaning things, and the list goes on. Through much of her parenthood, Shelly refused to work. She just sat around all day watching her soap operas, making her kids and friend do all the housework. But she actually had been working in the late 90s. She was actually a caseworker for the elderly, and it was out on the field where she met Ron Woodworth. He was helping to find homes for a client's cats when him and Shelly met. They started talking and really get to know each other. Ron was a pretty hefty guy in his mid-50s with a ponytail. He tended to wear a lot of jewelry, including earrings and necklaces. He was a gay man that had gotten out of a long-term relationship. At the same time, he was having trouble with his mother and had a lot of family issues. That fateful day that he met Shelly is so incredibly unfortunate because he would be the newest person that Shelly talked into moving in and helping out around the house. Whatever pleasantries they had at the house were very short-lived. Ron would always answer with, yes, Shell dear, and it wouldn't be long before Shelly had him completely controlled, totally under her thumb. Shelly would yell at him to clean, and she would take away his bathroom privileges, saying that a fag cannot use her bathroom. 
He once defecated outside, and Shelly told Dave to beat him up for it, and he did. He once peed in a cup inside because he didn't want to wake up Shelly about going to the bathroom. She commanded that he drink the cup of urine. Without blinking, he downed the whole thing. The abuse would continue. He was forced to work in the yard all day, with just his underwear on and no shoes. His feet would get blistered and swollen. Shelly would punish Ron by pouring bleach on his feet and his legs when they were already cut and bruised and had lacerations. Throughout his time there, Ron had a special relationship with Tori. She hated to see her good friend, her uncle Ron, getting punished like this. She asked her mom to not hurt Ron, and Shelly told her to mind her own business. Later, Ron told Tori that he doesn't love her anymore. He obviously said this at Shelly's behest but it broke Tori's heart and she ran away crying. But later that night, after everyone went to sleep, Tori gave Ron a big hug while he was sleeping on the floor and he smiled at her. Meanwhile, while this was going on, Nikki had been living with her grandmother, Lara, who was also Shelly's stepmother. Nikki couldn't hold in her secrets any longer and divulge what had happened to Kathy, how her mother had brutalized her until she finally passed away and that Dave had burned her body and discarded it. She went to the police at Laura's insistence. Laura had always known that Shelly was not an ideal person, but this had actually shocked her. Shelly had been lying to everyone for years, claiming that she had cancer when she actually didn't. Shelly would even have Dave drive her to the hospital and then slip out the back and return eight hours later. Laura would call out Shelly on her lies, but Shelly would never admit to it. Deputy Ed Bergstrom and the police department never did a thorough follow through on Nikki's statements. They knew Kathy was declared missing by her family, but there was no big follow up. They tried to call Sammy, but Sammy would never answer to give a statement. Back in Raymond, another suspicious death was about to occur. Shelley had gotten to know a World War II veteran named James McClintock, who was actually a friend of Kathy Loreno's family. Shelley spoke of him as the father that she never had. In time, he would make Shelly the executor to his estate and leave his house to her. Shelly would send Ron over to his house to take care of the old veteran. One day, James suddenly hit his head and he passed away. It was never looked at as a suspicious death to law enforcement, but after it happened, Shelly would berate Ron and accuse him of killing James. Ron would deny it until he acquiesced and told Shelly what she wanted to hear. He would say, sorry, Shell dear. I did it, Shell dear. Please don't tell on me, Shell dear. Shelly told him that she wouldn't tell, but she would continue to berate him, calling him a fag and a murderer. Shelly got into Ron's head and made him believe that the police had a warrant out for his arrest for murdering James. Ron became completely paranoid, and so Shelly continued to abuse him, making him punch himself in the face, telling him to jump off the roof of the house continuously until he was covered in blood. She would pour bleach on him and then feed him pills. Tori was horrified. One day, Ron had just suddenly disappeared, and Tori knew that her mother had killed him. Tori knew that she couldn't stay in this crazy house any longer. Unbeknownst to Shelly, Tori was in contact with her sisters Nikki and Sammy, Sammy who was in college at the time away from home. Tori had admitted that Shelly was physically and mentally abusing her. Tori admitted to Nikki she was certain their mother had killed Ron. Nikki and Sammy told Tori that their mother had killed Kathy. Tori wouldn't have remembered Kathy too much because she was so young when Kathy was killed. Tori found some personal effects of Ron's, which she hid as evidence before Nikki and Sammy went to the Pacific County Police. Nikki told her story again of how Kathy was killed and burned, and they also told them that Ron had likely been killed by her mother. They also told of the current abuse of their little sister, Tori. Dave had actually been out of town when Ron was killed. When he got home and found out, he took it upon himself to bury Ron on the property. When Sammy and Nikki told the story this time, the police were sure to follow up, even though it was too late for Ron. They went to the house and gathered up Tori. Shelly threw a hissy fit, saying that she's a good mother, Tori is spoiled, and she's never been abused. Shelly immediately called Sammy and asked her if she said anything to the police. Sammy denied saying anything of course, and Shelly seemed to believe her. As Tori was being taken from the house, she told the officer where she hid Ron's things on the property. 
Dave and Shelly were taken in and it didn't take long before Dave broke down and told them everything about Kathy and Ron. The death of Kathy had really been weighing on him over the years. He was culpable of what he had done, but he was merely Shelly's puppet. He couldn't say no to her. In a different life, he may have been an upstanding citizen, not somebody that was capable and complicit to murder. The last piece of the puzzle was what happened to Shane. Shelly contended that he had run away to start a job in Alaska so many years earlier, but what actually happened was a lot more sinister. Shane was a good kid. He knew what was happening around him was pure evil. Before Kathy had died, he took a photograph of Kathy in the weakened state that she was in. After Kathy died, he showed the photo to Nikki and said that he was going to take it to the police. He thought he could trust his cousin with that information, but Nikki ended up telling her mother that Shane had the picture. Shelly went to Dave and told him about this, who confronted Shane before beating the shit out of him. Dave accused him of trying to destroy the family. Not long after the incident, Shelly talked Dave into getting rid of Shane permanently, and her lapdog obliged. Dave would sneak up behind Shane one night, who was rooming in the pole building outside the house. Dave shot Shane in the back of the head with a 22 carbine rifle, killing him instantly. In February of 2004, Dave took a plea deal. Instead of first degree murder of Shane, he pleaded guilty to second degree murder and unlawful disposal of human remains, and aiding in criminal assistance. He was sentenced to 15 years, and he would be released in 2016 after serving 13 and some change. Shelley would end up taking an Alford plea, in which she would maintain her innocence but recognize that the state had enough evidence to convict her. Her plea deal would give her a sentence of 17 years, but after Shelley spoke in front of the judge and seemed to blame Nikki and Shane for Kathy, the judge tacked on another 5 years for a total of 22 years. Shelley Watson Notek, at the age of 68, was released on November 8, 2022, after serving 18 years. To this day, Nikki has had no contact with Shelly or Dave, who she has always seen as so pathetic. However, Sammy and Tori do maintain a relationship with their father Dave, putting all the blame on their mother Shelly.